Hey there, I've got something a little interesting today. And no, the interesting isn't the 9090 DB. I do quite a few of these receivers. They're nothing new to me at all. Um, they basically come in here for one or two problems, either power supply issues that affect the tuner or a blown output stage. And this one's here for a blown output stage. That's by far the most common repair we see on these. The outputs on these are not particularly durable. What is interesting though, is that this receiver has gone through now, including me, three technicians, including the last one who said, I can't fix it, it burned a trace. And it burned this trace here, and it appears to be going into the output snubbing network, which tells me the output became unstable at some point and went into gross oscillation. Again, typical of a large amplifier that is malfunctioning. What's interesting though, is when I removed the heat sink, I saw something I really didn't like. Now, any experienced technician should know this if they pay attention to industry trends. Um, there have been a ton of white papers from semiconductor firms about counterfeit semiconductors. Now, what makes me think that I've got counterfeits here? Well, first off on the drive card, I saw some transistors that were installed in these locations here, and they were or at least claim to be, original NEC parts. We should take a look at that NEC transistor there. See it how it's the old NEC logo? That's what we would expect to see from a transistor from the late 70s. We would not expect to see a really nice shiny tab and the newer NEC logo. Especially considering this part was discontinued pretty quickly in favor of newer transistors later on. We also note a few other problems. The technician, either of them, did not replace any of the fusistors. These resistors are worse than carbon composition resistors actually in terms of reliability. They tend, they t but they tend to have the same problems. They drift in value and they get noisy. And in the case of this amplifier, they're in the signal and power paths. So if those things go, go squirrely on you, the whole amplifier can become unstable. This can cause failures. We did note that one of the pots has been changed, I believe that's the bias pot, and a couple, um, four electrolytics have been changed with some no-name Chang X brand, yuck. That's going to get replaced with some Panasonics for sure. And of course I'm going to replace all those suspect and known to fail early resistors. So that's one suspect counterfeit transistor. So how do we tell whether a transistor is counterfeit? Well, you don't for sure. I would have to de-encapsulate that transistor, which is a destructive disassembly process. And it's nasty and involves nitric acid and I really don't want to do it. But on the TO3 side of things, on the outputs, it's a little easier. So I've done enough of these and I've seen enough Toshiba transistors in general that I know what 1970s TO3 package Toshiba parts look like. They have this dull finish to them and the case itself kind of has this domed, slightly domed profile to it. It's really hard to see on camera. It's pretty slight. The case but the case looks pretty dull, and the ink used is either blue, is not blue, or is either red or black. And it's usually red. And it doesn't easily wipe off. And by that, let me uh, get a uh, rag here and a little alcohol and show you that it doesn't easily wipe off. So we've got our 2SD424, these are original. And note that there's practically no fading of the ink at all. Known as transferred to the rag. Well, let's go to one of these Toshiba transistors. And I did the same thing over here and it just wiped completely off. And if I do the same over here, it too is now naked and anonymous. And the reason for that 
is these counterfeiters, they don't care about the quality of their product. They just care about deceiving you so, they, so that you buy their stuff. And good inks, good curing, hard curing inks are expensive. What's not expensive is ink that's fit for, you know, just a permanent marker. And basically, that's what kind of marking was on those transistors. It was basically permanent marker ink. Another thing that's really fishy is we'll take a look at these transistors. You'll note that this is supposedly 1970s part numbers, but new Toshiba logo. And one thing you have to realize is Japanese companies, by and large, ditched metal, pla metal can packages very quickly in favor of plastic packages by about 80 or so. Um, these were on the way out very quickly, and by about the mid-80s or so, they were just gone in the Japanese tra transistor catalogs as far as, or at least as far as uh, utilization from mainline audio companies went. Uh, I cannot find a T03 outside of a few isolated cases, anything, any Japanese stereos made after maybe 81 or so. I, I just can't think of anyone that uses them. Even the big uh, 150 watt stuff, it all went to plastic packages, either a push-pull pair of parallel TO3Ps or MT200 packages. These were gone pretty quickly by about 80, 81. So why does it have that new Toshiba logo if the demand for these transistors evaporated that quickly once the plastic equivalents were introduced? And they're a very good reason to use the plastic package equivalents. They're easier to install, they're more compact, and they're less expensive. And they offer the same performance. Pretty much the only thing still using TO3 these days are very high SOA parts that actually need a metal can for heat sinking. And even then, plastic packages have gotten good enough and big enough that even those applications are quickly going by the wayside. And I think on semiconductor is one of the last holdouts as far as big semiconductor firms still making TO3 packages. They call it TO204AA, um, but it's TO3. But even then, they see the writings on the wall, and even they make the plastic equivalent of the same transistors. So, why do we have this new logo? Well, it's because these parts are probably counterfeit. Another thing is we can take a look at how they're made. These allegedly have the same part number, but you'll see the chamfer on the edge of the can is much more aggressive on this can than this one, which tells me these are actually not the same device at all, or something different, and they're probably even made by different companies. But no, they claim to be the same part number, and even the same gain group, which is totally not true. And these counterfeit parts are most likely why this amplifier failed, even though the technician thought he did everything right. <laughs> They're simply not performing up to specification. Who knows what's in there? It might just be two N3055s and the complement. Um, it, although it's probably not that egregious because it, they didn't just straight up blow up under the power supply voltage, but I can pretty much guarantee you just because of the, the physical characteristics that those are not genuine transistors. But again, a definitive test would require destructive disassembly. So what am I going to do? Well, considering that I can't get those original transistors easily because they haven't been made in nearly 40 years, I'm going to use a substitute transistor. I'm going to use on semiconductor MJ21195 and MJ21196. Um, those are actually upgraded parts and they significantly enhance the durability of these Sansui receivers. I'll probably use... Oh, M, what is it, MJE15033, and it's complement for the drivers. Um, you have an option there. I also have some genuine Toshiba drivers that are new. 
and some genuine Sonkin drivers that are also new current production and bought from an authorized distributor. The lesson here is you don't have to use original parts for most transistors. Um, the circuits are pretty flexible and in a lot of cases you can get a slightly higher performance with a modern part. But if you want to avoid counterfeits, you got to watch where you buy this stuff. The manufacturers have what we call authorized distributors, and that's just a distributor that the manufacturers assign to distribute their parts. If you buy from a non-authorized distributor, however, you don't really know where that distributor got their parts. You don't know if they got it from some back alley in Shenzhen or if they actually contacted the manufacturer and paid full price. But do you want to risk it? Do you want to risk destroying a receiver that's worth about a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks, depending on the market? Just to save a few bucks on eBay or Alibaba or Amazon for your transistors? Do you really think that a seller on eBay has ten thousand plus of a forty year old transistor? Really? Do you really think they're going to be that easy to find? No, they're not. They're all gone. Supplies of them dried up at least 20 years ago. So use your head. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And all you got to do is get online and ask on what any of these big audio forms like Audio Karma or even slash our audio repair on reddit which is how you can contact me um, just ask hey I've got this transistor what's a good substitute for it and heck I'll even teach you how to sub these things but don't go and get some no-name remarked fake off eBay or other gray market source it's just not worth the risk and in this case, it's going to cost the owner of this receiver nearly $300 to repair because I have to completely undo every single thing the previous technician replaced and still go after some of the work he didn't do, like changing out those fusistors. So I basically got to completely undo his repair and then completely perform the repair. So it's even more labor than he started with. And all that because he didn't quite like how long I took on projects and he didn't quite like how long I, ch how much I charged. He found somebody that was a little faster and a little cheaper. And it came back here anyway. Well, live and learn and then call Andrew's Electronics.